Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. Well, you know, Mark Anthony, I love having you on Coast to Coast, so thank you mate. thank you for the research you've done for tonight. Oh, thank you, Ian. It's an honor to be here, and uh, it's great working with you again. So, and that's what it always felt, feels like, actually. It's like, we're, I love how you carry your part of the show and carry that into open lines coming up. There's a lot of ways to look at luck. I was, I, I often look at luck in terms of, the things which are probabilities, but it just kind of comes up, you know, against you from time to time. Like, for for example, there was a story on the, the website at coasttocoastam.com about the uh, cellular, cell phones going off as a result of that big emergency transmission they had earlier this week. And the the people who are Amish who had secret phones who were busted because those phones started going off, regardless of whether they had the ringtone off or whatever. And it's like, oh, that's a little unlucky. And then I then I see the story about, I don't know if you saw the video, I would recommend it if you go to coasttocoastam.com, about people who were on this little train in Colorado, kind of it sounds like a little tourist train, and the and they get video of what appears to be Bigfoot walking across uh, the brush, uh, not too far off the the railroad tracks, they get a pretty clear image of whatever it is. Now, maybe that's a hoax. Maybe that's all been pre-prepared. Maybe it's whatever. But that's lucky, right, that they happen to have a cell phone camera in their hand as something like that is is happening. How do you, in generally, how do you look at luck? I, I think um, I like to to paraphrase Thomas Jefferson is the harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. You know, I mean, it, it's like winning the lottery. You've actually got to buy the ticket to right. win. Because you know, a lot of people, I right. wish I could win the lottery. Or um, right. a lot of times when I'm on call-in shows, people call in and they mistake me being a medium, which is communicating with spirits, for being a fortune teller. And they say, "Well, um, will I find a new job? And will I find a uh, love in my life?" And right. I'll ask, well, what are you doing about it? Well, nothing. <laughs> it's like, okay, <Yeah. laughs> so you create your own luck in yeah. many situations. Uh, and then there's times like you're talking about where you could be in a particular place at a particular time and something happens. The question then, Ian, and we've talked about this before the last time I was yeah. here, is synchronicity. Because sometimes you will find yourself in a particular situation at a precise moment, which affects the rest of your life. And sometimes that can be really good, and sometimes that can be really negative. Um, my dad, the Navy SEAL, always used to say to me that your life can change in a second. So let's say that you make an improper left turn and right. when you're driving into an intersection and you get into a horrific collision. That one second has changed your life in a terrible way. Um, or perhaps you could be in a job interview and they throw a question at you out of left field and you give the answer that really impresses your potential employer and then they hire you for a great job. So that one second has changed your life in a positive way. I see that. Uh, as long as we're quoting uh, on luck, I, I think it was Seneca, right, the Roman philosopher. I think it was Seneca who is originally... Um, I believe he's credited with luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And so the people on the train, they didn't panic. They didn't scream. They didn't they had an opportunity to take this video of, of Bigfoot or what appears to be Bigfoot. They had a camera in their hand and they did it. That's, that's preparation meeting opportunity. And I like all that. Um, I think what's interesting is when luck gets in your head, 
as and I, you know to your to your point about the lottery you know people talk about luck in that way and i say luck would be winning the lottery without having bought a ticket that's just like that's a miracle that's not <laughs> yeah that's not luck that's a miracle right? <laughs> that's why it's crazy so even if you have a 1 in 10 billion chance of something it could happen so but i, I think that kind of gets in some people's heads right and they think of themselves early on in life they start thinking of themselves as unlucky as born under a bad sign that that somehow the universe is against their own success. And it's hard to break people free from that perspective once it's become ingrained. I couldn't agree with you more because once you develop a mindset, whether it's positive or negative, a negative mindset seldom results in positive results. And... When in, in my work, both as a medium and then when I was practicing law full time, and I would um, um, I dealt with both criminal cases and civil complex civil litigation, and there would be clients I had that uh, were physically injured or they had severe illnesses, perhaps right. cancer or something like that, and the ones that seemed to make it the longest or even defeat the the illnesses or the injuries were determined to do it. They had yeah. that positive mindset, I'm going to beat this, I'm going to do right. that. The ones that gave up seemed to go right away. And and certainly, um, you know, you can only have so much control over something like cancer. But the thing is, a positive mindset has a lot to do with your success in life. Because there's a lot of people, like you just said, that go around with this, oh, I was born under an unlucky sign, nothing ever works out for me. And so they flood their head with negativity, and then everything that they're looking at is through this filter, right. which, you know, in other words, it's hard to be optimistic through misty optics. You're giving yourself um, um, not a head start, but you're you're always at the, the rear of the pack because you're putting that intention out there. So So luck is... I think it's part of our life, but it's also how we shape things and, and perceive things. And luck is oftentimes, and that's why we're talking about Friday the 13th, and there's a number of superstitions and phobias out there, which, you know, people are are so afraid of certain things. But, but once again, once you begin to understand and approach a fear, approach a superstition, what we find in, in the study of ancient mysteries and paranormal phenomenon, in fear-based beliefs, there is some factual basis which led to what that fear, what that phobia, right. what that superstition is. And in this case, the, it, it, it does seem like the legend of October the 13th is the... Uh, the uh, the truth of why this date looms so large for us. Well, well absolutely, and that's why it's a, it's such an honor being on coast to coast on Friday, October thirteenth, <laughs> because the, because seven hundred and sixteen years ago, on Friday, October thirteenth of thirteen oh seven. So we are seven hundred and sixteen years to the day is when it is widely believed that the fear, this uh, the phobia of Friday the 13th um, originated. And, and I love um, the, how the psychologists, there's two, two technical terms, paraskivi decatriphobia, which is the Greek <laughs> term, and frigatriska decaphobia, which is the Latin term, both of which mean fear of Friday the 13th. Um, so these are... This is a legitimate fear for a lot of people. Um, well, there, and there's just triskaidekaphobia. People, every time 13 comes up, they think it's unlucky. Yes. Right? It's, it's just the number itself, not even attaching it to a date or, or a day of the week. Well, there's a lot to it, though. Um, according to numerologists, 12 is considered the number of completeness. There's 12 astrological signs, 12 months in a year, 12 hours on a clock. In ancient Greece, there were 12 main gods on Mount Olympus. In, the, um, in Judaism, there were 12 tribes of Israel. In, the, in Christianity, there were 12 apostles of Jesus. So 12 was always looked at as a, a number of completeness, 
um, a high standard. But the number 13 was irregular because it considered to upset the balance of 12. And the belief where this came from may have originated in Norse mythology and then mirrored in early Christian beliefs about the Last Supper, that having 13 people seated at a table, one will die within a year. Hmm. And according to legend, there are 13 witches in a coven. But, you know, this may sound irrational, but then again, think about it, Ian. And, and for all you Coast to Coast listeners, most cities don't have a 13th Street. Hotels have no 13th floor because many people won't stay on that floor. But I'm, I'm, so, let's, I'm so glad that tradition stopped. There was a time when that's always true. And, and you can almost mark buildings at a time when people started saying, or architects, or it's just saying pish posh. There is a 13th floor. We might as well call it the 13th floor because you count them up from the ground. There is going to be a 13th floor. It's not like you magically skip a floor. I, I know. But... But then again, of all the NASA manned missions to the moon, it was Apollo right. 13 that, right. that had the disaster. And uh, thanks to the genius of NASA, and um, I have to put a plug in here for, for my dad who has passed on. He was one of the, the team, one of the aerospace oh, cool. team members that helped figure out how to get Apollo 13 back. So and whip so smart. It, yeah, well, in that situation, that was about as bad luck as you're going to get. Right. Um, you had, a, had an oxygen tank blow up on the command module, so clearly there was no way that the mission could be sustained. And, you know, I'm sure we've all um, heard or seen uh, excerpts, if not seen the movie Apollo 13. Yeah. But, um, they actually transmitted, Houston, we have a problem. And I remember being, I was really young, and my dad came home from work. And he said, we got to figure something out tonight. He came home to eat dinner, and he goes, you know, to my mom, i got to go back uh, back in. He said, we got to figure out something tonight, or these guys are going to die. And I said, mm. but, Dad, on TV they said it's going to be okay. He goes, that's what they're telling us. But <laughs> yeah, we don't exactly. come up with something tonight. And they did. Yeah. And so, so there's a situation that involves really bad luck. But then when you put the best and brightest on – Okay, instead of caving into the fear, let's ana- analyze the situation, take all the factors, what do we have to work with, and you come up with a solution. So, uh, you know, 13, yes, maybe maybe that was a coincidence, but I don't believe in coincidences, but it was Apollo 13 that almost didn't make it. You know, that is, it's, it's funny as you spell it out like that, and I'm I'm inclined to think that, this is what there's the certain amount of magical thinking goes into that, and I'm not, but but often it's sort of a reflection that people are focused on one thing, and in a way, it kind of helps them deal with the world. If if they can avoid thirteen, then they then they are actively trying to avoid problems, or they're actively trying to avoid bad luck, and or if they really look at October. You know, if they look at Friday the 13th and they think, well, I'm just going to stay in bed tonight. I'm going to stay close to home. Uh, you know, maybe that's its own kind of uh, way of acknowledging that the rest of my life is so good. This is what I'm I'm going to step aside for and not necessarily be so overwhelmed by 13 that they can't step outside. You see what I'm saying? It becomes a almost like a. Uh, a kind of symbolism for all that could go wrong. And so you try to avoid it just like we should normally. And there's actually statistics to back up what you just said. Huh. According to the late Donald Dossey of the Stress Management Center and Phobia Institute, Nashville, huh. North Carolina, 21 million Americans fear Friday the 13th to the point where they won't leave the house, they avoid normal routines. They won't drive. They won't fly. They're absolutely paralyzed by this fear. And it's been estimated, Ian, that nearly $900 million in business is lost every Friday the 13th. Wow. Because, and it shows, studies show that there's fewer accidents, fewer fires, fewer huh. thefts because people don't go out. So, there, you know, there's a flip side to it. Yeah, we're yeah. losing almost a billion in, in uh, revenue on Friday the 13th, <laughs> which is probably made up on Saturday the 14th. <laughs> but but um, because people 
don't, you know, a lot of people won't go out. They're not driving as much. There's less uh, mishaps. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's funny. It's, 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 you know, there's this, oh, it's bad luck. But then again, it does translate into, into actual, actual dollars. Mark, I was just reflecting real quickly on something you had said earlier about the 12 disciples. And I don't know whether you know this, but and stop me if you do, that Judas was, re- it was so important to maintain 12 disciples that when after Judas either hanged himself or exploded uh, in the middle of a, of a potter's field, depending on which part of the gospel you read, um, he was replaced by Matthias, who they had like a job interview in the whole bit. And they decided he was the one who should replace Judas so that they could maintain the 12. Um, and not a lot of people know a lot about it. Matthias. There isn't a lot to learn. But the way they chose Matthias was by drawing lots, was by essentially, you know, there's lots of different ways. It could be dice. We could look at lots, which just meant like a game of chance. But they, they sort of prayed over the game of chance. And whatever it was, whoever was chosen... That was what, that's what God wanted. And so that's how Matthias got in, to maintain the 12 through a game of chance. That's fascinating. Yeah, because 12, you know, like you, like you said, they had to maintain the number of 12, which was looked at as a, a sacred number. And right. Yeah, yeah. You know, numerology is, is really fascinating because um, science is, is, is so intertwined with mathematics. And when we look at frequency and vibration from the subatomic level on up, everything yeah. is able to be analyzed through this um, mathematical perspective. So, you know, there, there's, I believe, much more to this than than what people may initially initially feel. Yeah, so I accept that. All right, so, uh, but it, again, in sort of a religious twist on this is the, the Knights Templar, and you were just beginning to, to for people who don't know, to explain how the Knights Templar are connected to Friday the 13th. Absolutely. The Knights Templar are, you can't study ancient mysteries and paranormal phenomena nope. without coming in into into the realm of study about the Knights Templar. And this takes us back a thousand years in time to the Crusades. And the Crusades were a series of religious wars waged by Europeans in an attempt to reconquer what is now um, Israel uh, and and, uh, take possession of the city of Jerusalem, which was being held by Turkish Muslims. So, and the Knights Templar they were an order of knights who were also ordained priests. So they were this religious um, military order, but they were also the intellectual uh, component of the crusading armies. Well, you can't wage war without, without money. And the Knights Templar set up a banking system from Scotland all the way to Jerusalem, and there were Templar banks. Because if you were heading off to, to the Middle East a thousand years ago, it was extremely dangerous, and carrying a lot of gold and treasure with you in the army uh, was cumbersome and also opened you up to attack. So basically, you would deposit your gold, uh, your treasure, your silver, in a Templar bank. They would give you a certificate that you could redeem at any Templar bank, like I said, between between Scotland, throughout continental Europe, all the way to, to Jerusalem. And the Templars also charged interest, which was the crime of usury and the sin of usury. But, you know, because the, there was a financial practical element to it, the, the kings and uh, the popes and the, the uh, soldiers sort of overlooked that. And it wasn't a huge usury rate, which was interesting. I mean, usury now we associate with, like, the VIG. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that bad. Credit it card, was, yeah, credit card yeah. interest. Yeah, right. back then it was about 5%. It was about right. 5%. But there's more to the Templars than that. The reason that they're called the Templars is because in the First Crusade, um, which culminated in the capture of the city of Jerusalem in the year 1099, the Temple Mound, was was seized and the temple mound which is where um 
supposedly or, or, or is where archaeologists have determined the Temple of Solomon uh, was built is, is, uh, was seized by the, the, this particular order of knights, and then they were called the Knights Templar because they seized the Temple Mound. And mystery shroud, shrouded the Templars. Rumors circulated that they'd found the Holy Grail and the Lost Ark of the Covenant, and Harrison Ford notwithstanding. There was right. a practical side to them because of the banking system. And so the Templars became extremely wealthy, extremely um, influential right. um, in, throughout the entire crusading period. But then it became kind of a secret society. Not just anybody could join the Knights Templar. You had to be a great warrior. You had to be an intellectual. You had to be an ordained priest. Right. And supposedly they had um, very uh, secretive rituals. So, so there was this aura of mystery around them. But what happened was within about, about 200, uh, 250 years, the Crusades essentially turned out to be a military failure, even though for, for a time the Crusaders held what is now Israel and parts of Lebanon and Syria. Um, eventually the, the Turkish Empire overwhelmed them. And meanwhile, though, the Knights Templar business was booming. And the, the kings of Europe and then the Pope in Rome, they kept borrowing money. And by the early 1200s, while the Crusades had failed, the Templars were, were just rolling in cash. And two very powerful figures, King Philippe IV of France, known as Philippe the Fair. Apparently he was like this real handsome young king, but behind right. the good looks and the dashing smile, he was ruthless and vicious to the core. And his ally, Pope Clement V, they were drowning to debt in the Templars. And Ian, they couldn't repay the interest-bearing loans. Right. And you know, and the Templars, they may have been priests, but when it came to cash, they were not very forgiving, and they yeah. wanted those loans repaid. Well, the secretive nature of the Templars gave Philippe the Fourth and Pope Clement all the ammunition they needed. So, 716 years ago today. On Friday, October 13th of 1307, in a massive coordinated raid throughout France, the Knights Templar, um, Jacques, their, their Grand Master Jacques de Molay, and 60 of his senior knights were arrested in, in Paris and other places throughout uh, France. And they were charged with witchcraft, idolatry, apostasy, homosexuality, and of course, Usury, which had been overlooked, you know, charging right. interest, and they were charged with all of these. And the thing that happened after, in the aftermath of that is just absolutely horrific. You know, this was medieval France, and even though there was no evidence um, other than maybe the usury because they were charging interest, which the popes and the kings have been, you know, giving them a pass on for 200 years, but this was medieval France, and securing a confession was guaranteed. These guys were subjected to the rack, they, to thumb screws, to uh, the most horrific forms of medieval torture. Everything that you see in a medieval torture chamber was thrown at these guys, and surprise, all of them confessed. And the Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, was burned at the stake in Paris out in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. And Ian, as the flames engulfed him, he cried out that both the Pope, Pope Clement, and King Philippe will meet me before God. Within a month, Pope Clement dropped dead from a stroke. Mm -hmm. About a month after that, King Philippe was killed in a hunting accident. Now, rumors started spreading that Jacques de Molay used his witchcraft powers to avenge the Knight Templars. And if his satanic powers could do this to God's representative on earth, the Pope and the all-powerful King of France, was anyone safe? Well, let me tell you, when something like this happened, Ian, the rumors flew throughout Europe. 
And then people started thinking, well, maybe Jacques de Molay was a martyr and King Philippe and Pope Clement were struck down by God right. for killing innocent men. The evil plan of the king of the pope was set into motion on Friday the 13th. Or were these evil agents of Satan that we called the Knights Templar, where they finally stopped on Friday the 13th? So now Friday the 13th was considered a cursed day and a warning to all who mocked God. Hmm. Uh, I'll add as an asterisk on this, and of course we are going with some crypto history in some of this, but the, also the tunnels on, underneath um, the Temple Mount that might have contained treasure has yeah. often been associated with, uh, with the Knights Templar as well. Yeah, that's and so that, that begins October the 13th. So how does it... Is it because of the Freemasons? Is it because of, I mean, where, how is it that this ends up, that number, that date, shaping the U.S. Constitution? Well, it gets even better. <laughs> That's why the Knights Templar are so, so much fun. And, and I want to take a step back. Yes, um, you, I'm glad you brought that up. The temples, I mean, excuse me, the tunnels under the Temple Mound in Jerusalem, that's uh, where it was rumored not only did they, they locate treasure that was hidden, you know, the treasures of, of right. King Solomon, but right. also potentially the, the uh, Holy Grail and the Ark right. of the Covenant. Um, so, so, and, and when the Templar seized the mound, uh, the Temple Mound, apparently it was off limits to everybody else. So there, there was always an element of mystery uh, surrounding them, and uh, and certainly their their vast wealth didn't didn't uh, help help the the perception um, among uh, kings and and the popes and the common soldiery. But not all the Knights Templar in France were wiped out. Some of them escaped and they went to Scotland, and in Scotland, because they were intellectuals and they were highly skilled craftsmen, particularly with stone, they became stonemasons, and they became integral to the construction and uh, projects in Scotland and the Scottish economy, and it is believed that they evolved into the Freemasons. In other words, they were the free, free to, the they they were the free Templars who were stone masons. They were they were free from the wrath of uh, the King of France and the Pope. Well, over the centuries, uh, the Freemasons also continued their their uh, status, their economic uh, you know their economic well being, and they emigrated to the New World. Many of the founding fathers of the United States Constitution including uh, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, of the 39 men who signed the U.S. Constitution, get this, Ian, 13 of them uh -huh. were Freemasons. Right. Okay, these were very educated men with strong backgrounds in law and history. So in 1791, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution were enacted and as an attorney, and I'm, I mean, I'm known as the psychic lawyer, so, you know, not only do I study history and paranormal and spiritual phenomenon, but also I look at it through a legal lens. If you look at the first ten amendments, the fourth amendment is the ban on unreasonable search and seizure. In other words, if law enforcement is going to burst into your home and search it, they have to have a warrant, a properly executed warrant. The fifth amendment is the right against self-incrimination. You always hear about people, I'm taking the fifth. Sure. On the, you know, right. The Sixth Amendment is the right to counsel. You can't just arrest somebody and, and put them on trial without giving them the benefit of having legal counsel. But it is the Eighth Amendment, the ban on cruel and unusual punishment. In mm. other words, torture. So it is believed in paranormal circles, and this is one of my theories, that if the Freemasons were the heirs of the Knights Templar, then what happened to them in 1307, on October 13, 1307, when they were arrested, they certainly were aware of this. This was part of their tradition, part of their heritage, and that was the motivating influence that when crafting this amazing, 
incredible document, the United States Constitution, that there were to be built into it protections against unreasonable search and seizure, the right against self-incrimination, the right to counsel, and a ban on cruel and unusual punishment using torture to extract confessions. And Ian, I believe that in a sense, the sacrifices, the torture, and the suffering endured by the Knights Templar was not in vain. And ironically, this would make Friday the 13th our lucky day because it was the genesis of constitutional (laughs) freedoms that so many of us take for granted. That's a nice reversal. And I agree, too. Um, And we should probably also point out, was there an intentional limitation on the number of colonies so that there would be 13 original? Um, (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's, I mean, literally, I mean, could they, were they, I don't know enough about that early period to know whether or not there were other colonies that they could have made states, but chose not to because they thought the best foot forward in the eyes of, uh, you know, liberty and egality and, and, uh, and, and prosperity would be to start with the number 13. It, it certainly all lines up. 13 Freemasons um, signed the Constitution for the 13 original colonies, which became states um, at that time. I mean, there's just so much how 13 permeates our culture. I mean, I'm sure you can take any, any number and try to do that, but 13 keeps popping up all throughout history. Yeah. You know, in some cultures, like uh, the ancient uh, Turkish culture and the ancient Chinese culture, 13s looked at as a, a number of good luck. But in the um, Middle Eastern, uh, you know, the Turks notwithstanding, and in the European cultures, particularly in the medieval era up until today, 13 has been looked at as a negative number. But I don't think that uh, we should look at it that way. Um, when When the founders of the of the United States. Um, it was really radical what they were doing. We were the first. The United States was the first Western country, with the possible exception of the Netherlands, that did not have a religious head of state. Yeah. Because you had, you know, you had the, the Church of England, you had right. certainly the Roman Catholic Church was heavily invested um, in, in um, all the uh, Catholic countries, the Protestant League right. in Germany, there were religious, you know, heads of state. And I mean, the, uh, the religious uh, wars in Europe were raging in the backdrop of that. They went, we don't want any piece of that. Yeah, we don't want any piece of that. And, you know, the separation of church and state, which is enshrined in the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause of Congress, shall make no laws uh, respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This was really radical stuff. Also, that could have also been colored by what happened with the Knights Templar, because think about it, the King of France, who um, was in league with uh, the Pope and um, uh, the Catholic, uh, the Pope of the Catholic Church, used religious charges uh, to, sure. to crush them. Yeah, we so, still do. In a lot of ways, politicians are still... <laughs> trying to, you know, use... Yeah, and I'm I'm a big... Look, I'm I'm a man of faith, and and I do not believe that religion is necessarily a negative thing, but when you look at countries that are ruled by a theocracy... No, it doesn't go well. No, it doesn't. (laughs) And, you know, we had some very, very brilliant founding fathers. Now, granted, they were not perfect human beings. Um, George Washington owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Uh, they didn't uh, grant uh, equal rights to women at the time, but no. they were also children of their era. And for that era, they did a radical departure from the norms. Nobody had ever done anything like this before, and they they allowed or enacted the ability for the Constitution to be amended because they also knew that society was not static and would change over time. So much more to get to when it comes to luck, bad luck, and uh, Friday the 13th. 
you know, it's no surprise, Mark Anthony, that there was a whole series built around this and, and that it had to do with, you know, a serial killer and all of that. Um, but, and I haven't kept up on my Friday the 13th movie, so I, I, I don't know exactly where it stands now in terms of the, uh, if you will, character arc of the story. But what I do know and what I've, is that it, it does exploit this concept, this, this, you know, age old fear of a number. And it just seems like the fear is that thing, which is the one that drives us, not the number itself, but the way you were talking about it with the framers of the constitution, sort of personally, intentionally choosing 13, um, makes me wonder whether there's something to this idea that 13 is something we should be happy about. Certainly there's 13 stripes in the flag and that was instituted in the flag act of whatever it was, 1777 or something. And then there's the, uh, the 13 stars, uh, a white stars across the blue banner, uh, in the, uh, in the flag as well. So 13, not in a bad way, but in a good way seems to replicate itself over and over again. Yeah, yes, it does. Yes, it does. And um, I think this is fascinating. I mean, on one hand, maybe we're reading too much into it, or on the other hand, maybe we are noticing uh, things that have been purposely, purposely infused into our our government, into our legislative and judicial history. From uh, directly related to the Masons and that Masonic view that may be tied directly to the, you know, to their origins as the Knights Templar. And that, that, that is entirely possible. And people are afraid of, of superstitions. Um, some, but, but the thing about superstitions is they can be good or they can be bad. In other words, people that are so afraid of going out on Friday the 13th well, they're not putting themselves in harm's way if they're staying home. Then there's other people who say, well, I have my lucky rabbit's foot or my lucky penny. Right. And so by feeling that they have an amulet, a charm, a talisman that brings them good luck, then it also reduces anxiety and fear. But then there's people who have um, – there's, see, there's a difference between a fear and a phobia. Right. Fear is a rational concern of a threat caused by a person, event, or situation. In other words, like you're in a burning building and you're afraid. Well, that's that's you right. know that's logical. But a phobia is is an intense anxiety when there is no immediate threat, and so phobias create an intense anxiety out of proportion to the situation. So a phobia Friday the 13th, you're so afraid you won't go out of your house, um, but, but what's the actual threat? And, 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 you know, one of my favorite superstitions to study is walking under a ladder. Yeah. You always hear about people don't walk under a ladder. Sure. And what's cool about that one, Ian, this may be the oldest superstition on record. And the reason I, I believe this is at the spider caves near Valencia in Spain. <laughs> it was discovered in Mesolithic rock paintings of a ladder. So a ladder is one of the earliest human inventions, which makes sense. You know, you got to create right. this thing that you can climb up and it's controlled sure. and, and all that. But this superstition has three elements to it, practical, precognitive, and spiritual. All right, practical. It's dangerous to walk under a ladder, all right, because something can fall <laughs> off of it. And fear... Or you could knock somebody else off of it, too, or which is... Could, exactly. You could knock somebody yeah. else off of it. So so creating a fear that if you walk under this, it's bad luck. You know, that fear deters people from doing foolish, stupid things. Sure. The precognitive element about this superstition, walking under a ladder, um, originates from the resemblance of ladders to gallows. Oh. Are hanged. Yeah, so the superstition, Ian, is if you walk under a ladder, you're destined for the gallows yourself. Oh, that's interesting. I've never and heard that. In medieval Europe, the ladder, a ladder leaning against a wall was symbolic of the Holy Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh. And, and if you walked under the ladder, 
it was blasphemy, and you were breaking the Trinity, which could attract evil spirits. But in, in all of these situations, basically, the, the fear, the superstition was to keep you from doing something stupid, <laughs> which is walking right. under a ladder where, like you said, you could knock someone off or somebody could drop a brick or, or right. something on you. Um, so uh, all these superstitions have some factual basis to them. Well, so I'm trying to think about the black cat thing. Because I had a black cat for years, and uh, when I was a kid, pure black cat. So, you know, that was the other thing, too. There's, there was no white mitten paws or anything of that. 100% black cat. Uh, and he was just a great cat, right? He was just a terrific house cat. Uh, it, it, but other people would get freaked out by him. And I'm like, by Benjamin? <laughs> what are you talking about? You, you know, there was just, it, but that's the other thing, too. So what's the origin of that, then, if? If I can, yeah, cats are are we uh, human beings have a very uh, dubious uh, relationship with cats, and it's believed that cats may be the animal that's been domesticated by humans the longest. Um, back in in the Neolithic age, cats would prey on on uh, you know rodents, and so humans liked them around their food supplies because right. cats would be eating the things that'd be eating uh, you know what. Um, right, you know, or leaving uh, or leaving yeah. fleas or ticks or you know exactly. feces or whatever. Yeah, in the Egyptians, of course, they had the cat goddess Bastet, so cats were venerated. But in early Christian, in pre-Christian Europe, in the Celtic beliefs of northern France and particularly the British Isles, and and also in the Nordic culture, there was a, a worship of nature, and that's what the the modern Wiccans. You know, um, the word witch uh, derives from, from uh, Wicca, Wiccan. And there was a struggle uh, with the rise of Christianity between the, the nature worship and the Christian beliefs. And in the Dark Ages, witches were seen as carrying out the will of Satan, whose demons were believed to assume the form of animals, particularly black cats. And this belief was so prevalent that in 1223 A.D., Pope Gregory IX issued a church document which stated black cats were an incarnation of Satan. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is it's funny. You, you would think that the the um, the Vatican would have more important things right. to do than, than picking on, on uh, cats. black cats. Yeah, but but what happened from there? It was it was believed that if a black cat crossed your path. This was symbolic of evil intervening in your life's direction. So if a black cat walks, um, you know, crosses your path, and then there's a counter to that, that if a black cat crosses your path, you have to um, turn in a circle three times. In other words, you know, you rotate three times to your left as a counterbalance to this. And it's like... Really? So they're sitting around in the Vatican right. and churches throughout Europe <laughs> figuring these things out. But but that's where this comes from, is that that's why cats were called familiar, because a lot of you know religious extremists say familiar spirits uh, would turn into uh, particularly a cat or something sure. like a raven, you know, anything black. They never turned into a white dove or, you know, because those are right. always positive. Right. And um, so, so these things have, have um, permeated throughout our society. That's very interesting. We're talking with uh, Mark Anthony, and uh, the subject is good luck, bad luck, and especially with regard to October, Friday the 13th, which just passed. And I think there's a lot of people who didn't even realize that today was Friday the 13th. You know, I think there's a lot, we got, there's, I don't know, I could be wrong on that, but I, I wonder what percentage of people, you mentioned how many people fear Friday the 13th, but how many people don't even notice what day of the week it is, or for that matter, you know, what the date is of the month? Yeah, uh, yeah. like I was saying earlier, 21 million Americans, according to the uh, right. Anxiety and Phobia Institute, have uh, frigatrisca decaphobia, fear of Friday the 13th, and to the tune where they they won't travel, they won't go to school, right. they won't go to work. It costs the U.S. economy roughly a billion dollars every Friday the 13th. 
Well, it's sort of like um, it's sort of like the same sort of thing. We've come around the number six sixty six, but only since the movie The Omen. <laughs> you know, like before that, it was that was what you know. There was it was for it was it was it was almost like Bible trivia, right? And the number of the beast shall be six sixty six. Or I, I remember early on in getting faxes, sort of these blurry faxes that would pop up at radio stations where I worked, where, you know, they were talking about uh, 666 and its uh, validity in Christian numerology. But more recently, you know, scholars have determined that the number probably wasn't 666. It was 616, 616. And so here it's like, it kind of takes all if if there really was anything built around six sixty six where people won't print a ticket that says six sixty six or if you play the lottery number or something like that and you won that it's the devil or any any of the different interpretations around six sixty six. Well, what's fascinating if you add six plus one plus six, you have thirteen. And so, but with six six six, there's other theories that. In the early Christian era, um, during the reign of uh, the Roman Emperor Nero, who was in the, around right. 60, 60 A.D., that um, the early Christians um, were were um, Jews that had converted, and they used to communicate in coded messages uh, numerically, and with the numbers assigned to the Hebrew alphabet. The name Neron Caesar, you know, Nero right. Caesar, was six six six. There's other people that say that that was his address, uh, Nero's yeah. address. That's on right. Palestine Hill. And, well, if you think about when the early Christians were talking about the Antichrist, do you think they were worried about some nebulous mystical figure thousands of years in the future, or the psychopathic Roman emperor right. who's having them burned alive and fed to lions in the arena? So it is more likely that the 666 meant Nero. Also, that uh, the mark of the beast, uh, you cannot transact without right. um, without the mark of the beast. That's been reinterpreted like a billion times. A billion times, but in, in um, uh, Jewish culture, in, in the Hebrew religion, graven images were forbidden, and the Buying or selling with the mark of the beast meant using Roman coins, which was the currency of the empire, which, of course, had Nero's uh, Nero's uh, right. image depicted on it. So when you start looking at it from that perspective, it, it begins to, to um, add a new dimension to it. But since we're talking about the Romans, breaking a mirror being seven years bad luck. Yeah. Oh, I remember, like, you know, part of my family, my mom's family is Italian, and if somebody broke a mirror, it's like, oh, my God. You know, right. It, and, and this is actually um, another superstition which comes from the Roman Empire. Um, mirrors have been around for thousands of years. They've even, archaeologists have even found fragments of mirrors uh, that date from sites 6,000 years ago in what is now Turkey. Of course, the Egyptians were using them, and early uh, mirrors were generally uh, bronze or some other type of metal that was polished so you could see your image in it. And uh, they were very expensive. So, of course, once again, a a fear is uh, if you break um, um, something expensive, it's bad luck. But there's more to it than that. Mirrors were believed because you could see your reflection in it. It was believed that a mirror could capture your soul. So if you broke the mirror, you broke your soul. And that's why, according to medieval um, legends, vampires didn't cast a reflection in a mirror because they didn't have a soul. Right. And and then by the the middle, middle ages, around the 1200s, glass mirrors appeared, and they were super expensive. But by that time, the... The superstition about your soul being trapped in a mirror was extremely entrenched in society. And during that time, people covered mirrors at night because they believed that um, the soul would wander at night and could be trapped in a mirror. In fact, in current, um, in, 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 um, in 21st century Polynesian culture like Samoa, 
people cover mirrors at night because they believe the devil can look into your soul through a mirror. And, and I've known uh, people from the Polynesian culture who've explained this to me. And also, when I was in, um, in the Amazon in some pretty remote regions, and then also in some of the Leeward and Windward Islands in the Caribbean, the people there will not allow you to take their picture because they believe that the camera, the, the photograph, sure. captures their soul. So this is a very ingrained, ingrained superstition. But then why seven years bad luck? Uh, because seven would be a period of penance. After the seventh year, you were cleansed. Very good. And this, too, comes from the Romans, because in ancient Rome, they believed that life renewed itself every seven years. Right. So if you broke a mirror and you were breaking your health, you were breaking and injuring your soul, it would regenerate or be remedied in seven years. So, you know... There we go. <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about politics earlier, or at least, uh, you know, the founding fathers. And I'm reminded that it was Nancy Reagan, kind of of all people, uh, who had, in a, in a way, I guess we could call her a, 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 a staff a, astrologer or somebody who worked with her um, who would make predictions and that um, there were other people in the White House that were uncomfortable with Joan Quigley, but right. Joan Quigley herself um, was known for this and took pride in it, wrote a book about it, and said, and I, I'm going to pull this up from the wiki page while I stall for just a second. Uh, she wrote, not since the days of the Roman emperors and never in the history of the United States presidency has an astrologer played such a significant role in the nation's uh, affairs of state? Well, that may have been Joan Quigley's um, opinion, but one of the lectures that I give is rulers, royals, psychics, and spirits. She identified herself as saying that no uh, president, perhaps going, or any ruler going back to Rome of some sort, has had the kind of um, astrological dependence that Nancy Reagan had on her and therefore on uh, Nancy Reagan's husband, Ronald Reagan. And you, you, you call, you're throwing the BS flag on that because why? Well, uh, maybe she had more influence um, on the Reagans uh, than other psychics and, and psychics, mediums, and astrologers have had on presidents. But in my research, and I give a, um, um, a talk, that I've entitled Rulers, Royal Psychics, and Spirits. My research has indicated, Ian, that close to one-third of U.S. presidents have had some form of psychic medium or astrologer advising them behind the scenes. Didn't know. And, yeah, and this starts with the Lincoln administration. Oh, um, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah the Lincolns, um, they, they, by the time they were in the White House, they had lost two little boys, and Mary Todd Lincoln brought in Nettie Colburn Maynard, who's one of the most high-profile mediums of the day, to conduct seances to connect with uh, their, their little boys in spirit. And this was supposed to be secret, but of course it got out and the press got hold of it. And, and Mary Todd Lincoln uh, was a very unpopular first lady. And then when this came out, you know, they were saying that she was insane. But then by the 20th century, um, Woodrow Wilson actually was advised by the great Edgar Casey, and it was more for his health issues. Um, First Lady Edith Wilson, and then in the Warren G. Harding administration, um, Madam Marcia, who was a psychic advisor, used to meet regularly with First Lady Florence Harding. But arguably the most influential uh, psychic paranormal advisor to the presidents was astrologer Jean Dixon. She uh, met with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and in 1944, and she told him, because he wanted to know what's the post-World War II era going to look like, she said, China will become a communist dictatorship, Russia will replace Germany and Japan as our en enemy, and Mr. President, you have less than six months to live. And then he died 
in April of 1945, just as she predicted. She also predicted John F. Kennedy's demise in, uh, on November 22nd of 1963. She predicted Bobby Kennedy's assassination. In fact, she was at a conference at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, and somebody asked, will Bobby Kennedy be elected president? And she said he will never become president because of a tragedy right here in this hotel. One week later at the Ambassador Hotel, he was gunned down by Sirhan Sirhan. Richard hmm. Nixon actually met, not, not with Gene Dixon, but his, his secretary, Rosemary Woods. And I've, I've actually heard the uh, recording where Nixon was talking to Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State, who's still alive. He's like 101 years old. Yeah, I, I saw that the other day. Yeah, and he was, he was talking about what's going on in the Middle East. He's sharp as a tack. I mean, God bless the guy. And Nixon confided to Secretary of State Kissinger that, you know, Rosemary talks to that soothsayer. So, um, and then the Clintons, um, um, uh, Gene Houston would meet oh. regularly with Hillary Clinton. So the thing is, you people of power, you know, whether they're American presidents, Roman emperors, the British monarchy has been heavily involved with, with psychics and mediums, people that feel like they're children of destiny or of power, they oftentimes will, behind the scenes, consult with astrologers, psychics, mediums for guidance. And so, you know, I understand Joan Quigley and Nancy Reagan were really tight, but it is my belief that Joan Quigley is inaccurate and that um, many, many U.S. presidents, I believe close to a third of them, have uh, had some type of of psychic or um, um, astrological advisor behind the scenes. You know, and I don't, I guess she is, I, I, I've only met her a couple of times, but I wouldn't have put Gene Houston, Dr. Gene Houston, in the category of um, of psychics. I mean, she's a mind empowerment person. I don't know if, I don't know that much about her work. She was the first one to actually teach me about fractals and that... Right. Her fractal theory that we keep replicating mistakes or we replicate good things in our life, um, I thought it was very influential to me. But I didn't think of it as psychic or... Well, according to CNN on June 22nd of 1996... Yeah. This lady Hillary Rodden Clinton held imaginary conversations with Eleanor Roosevelt and Mahatma Gandhi as a therapeutic release, according to a new book written by Bob Woodward. And what it was, this was what the Clintons were saying because it was believed that Gene Houston was teaching Hillary Clinton how to channel. Hmm. And then the New York Times on June 24th of 1996 said, President Clinton's spokesperson said today that the meetings with Gene Houston were nothing more than a brainstorming session. And July 25th of 96, the Washington Daily News said that um, the Clinton statement were to flatten speculation that Houston was her, her guru and that she held White House seances to talk to Roosevelt and Mohandas Gandhi. Now, I'm, I don't want to disparage uh, no, Gene Houston. Fair uh, enough. This, this is what was in the news. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I accept that. I just uh, – I, I, and I, I, even as you said it, I'm reminded of it. Let me go to the wild card line. John is in Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, hello? There you go. Yeah, I um, good to talk to you guys. I saw this thing and it said that Friday the thirteenth is a day of divine of the divine feminine. In ancient times, it was the day of the goddess. Oh, interesting. And I don't know if there's anything to that. Uh, it says it talks about thirteen cycles and thirteen moons in a year, and um, the Freemasons and uh, early founders were into the goddess. They made sure to have goddess on the statues, uh, you know, on the Capitol building and such. Well, I think that's very interesting, John. Thank you. And uh, Mark, it sounds like something you're familiar with. Um, yes, um, and, and John, you are correct. Um, Frigga Trisca Decophobia, the word Frigga, is a variation on Frigga or Freya, who was the Norse uh, queen of the gods. 
and um, before Christianity, the number 13 was her sacred number, and she was also associated with black cats. And once again, what we were talking, Ian and I were discussing earlier about in the early Christian era, the nature worship of the Celtic and Nordic religions versus Christianity. And so, you know, 13, the divine feminine, the black cats really got, you know, um, oppressed and, and uh, suppressed uh, by the, the new religion uh, that was rising throughout the, the European world. So that's a very astute observation. Thank you for calling in. Good connection. Kathleen is in Pennsylvania on Coast to Coast for Mark Anthony. Um, hi, Mark Anthony. What I wanted to ask was, does 13 hold anything with the Muslim religion, like today with the Day of Rage and Tomorrow we have the solar eclipse. Is there a connection there? Oh, I've never um, heard of that. Not that I'm aware of right off um, right mm-hmm. off the bat, um, you know, because of events that, that uh, were set into motion last weekend. Um, I don't know if today was, was preplanned to be a day of rage. And, and uh, you know, I, I'd like to paraphrase Gandhi, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. Yeah. So you know, hopefully everybody will instead look at, you know, perhaps we need to have um, not just a day, but always a mindset of peace. Um, what Golda Meir once said was that when our enemies realize that they love their children more than they hate us, that's when there will be peace. Right. You know, um, I write a little bit about Islam, so let me let me speak about that just a little bit. I have a lot of friends who are Muslim. There's, there are, I, I, I can't account for because we, I don't know enough about them, but there are lots of cultural things which then get um, intertwined with Islam, just like there there is in you know parts of the United States and Christianity, where the so-called Christian belief is really just a cultural belief. It just maintains a particular point of view. I've never heard of one that has to do with Friday the 13th, um, or for that matter, you know, anything to do with Fridays, because Friday is is the holy, the beginning the holy of the day. holy day. Islam, yeah. 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 So, no, I mean, it's that... It's unlikely. Yeah, it's unlikely. Yeah. And it, the, I think a, a lot of Muslims, on the other hand, when they gather on Friday at mosques um, around the world, m- may not always have the same imam. They may not always have the same interpretation of the Quran, but I don't think there's anything in the Quran about the number 13 and I don't know enough. There could be some Muslim numerology that some people follow, but I've, I have to say I've, I've never heard um, of it. Um, Ian, I wanted to, um, cause I know, know we're running short on, on time. Um, I wanted to, to bring up something else that happened this week, 50 years ago. Sure. Um, October 11th of 1973, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, were abducted by what they described as essentially a UFO. And hmm. um, a few weeks ago, Philip Mantle, um, who is an, um, a UFOologist and alien abduction expert, was on Coast to Coast, and he was talking about Calvin. And I got to know Calvin over the years. I'd even conducted um, a reading for him. I considered him a friend, and uh, I wanted just to mention him and to honor Calvin for what he went through because um, I interviewed him twice for a podcast I was working on, and then I would call him afterwards. And he is considered the most credible abductee on record. He was interrogated by local law enforcement all the way up to the FBI, subjected to truth serum, polygraph, lie detector tests, hypnotherapy, each time came out 100% truthful. Um, in my work with him as a medium, I, I found him to be open, honest, and uh, what he said about the abduction and what they did to him, and also that it wasn't a singular event that 20 years later um, he was abducted by, he said it appeared to be the, the same entities again. And um, I know that, you know, Coast to Coast is a place where we can discuss this openly, but in the the past couple years, 
UFOs have gone from being fringe and, sure. and kookazoid, you know, like, oh, yeah, right. right, right, to now we're having congressional hearings on UFOs. Right. Other countries are admitting it, and it's it's coming forth. And Calvin, um, he was, you know, in his own words, he said, I was just a simple redneck. I was 19 years old. I was getting married in two weeks. He goes, Mark, you don't get famous and rich from saying you've been abducted by a, a right. flying saucer. Right. And what he went through in his life was, was absolute um, absolute hell, but he conducted himself with such a dignity, su- such integrity, and I think it's only fitting of all places um, here on Coast to Coast to honor and tribute yeah. Calvin Parker for what he went through 50 years ago. Mark is in Las Vegas on Coast to Coast AM. Mark? Hey, it's Mike. Mike in Las Vegas. Oh, Mike. Uh, it's hey, Mark on the yeah. screen. Uh, well, I wanted to say about the black cats. I, I got some info on that. Uh, the thing about it is in Europe and most of the rest of the world, uh, black cats are actually good luck. And uh, they consider good luck. We They became bad luck to us uh, during the revolution. And right before that, anything British, we hated <laughs> the coffee, you know what I mean, and then right. the coffee that's pretty sketchy around the Revolutionary War. You know, they called it chicory, and it could have sawdust and glass right. and everything else. Um, but uh, well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I never heard that about uh, that that, that yeah, connection. You can look it up. It's it's. Um, I will. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Let me get time for Barry, who's in Texas, on coast to coast. Barry, hi, Mark. Hey, how you doing, Barry? Yeah, I'm a retired elevator constructor, and I was given, <laughs> yeah, I was given a job to uh, operate an elevator for the construction work on a uh, a building that was under construction and it had 30 floors. So uh, almost as soon as I got on the job, I ran the elevator up to the top, and I felt an unusual jerk around somewhere between the 26th and 28th floor. <laughs> and from that moment on, the elevator would not go to 13th, and there was a 13th floor on the car station. Okay. So, so yeah. we, we, found, we found that the traveling cable had uh, uh, hung up on a bracket at, uh, at the 13th floor, and, and broke the wires that control the 13th floor. And, Was it uh, labeled the floor 13? Yeah. It huh? disabled, yeah. The elevator okay. would, not go, would no longer go to the 13th floor. <laughs> I, I like then, the, it's anecdotal, a little hard to work with, but still a good story. Thank you, Barry. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Yeah, it sounds like you had your own version of Apollo 13. That must yeah. have been really something. Yeah. You know, when, when when an event like that happens, and then it just happened to be right at the 13th floor. Wow, Barry, that is, that's a great story. Thanks for but, sharing. But of the thousands and thousands of elevators in this country that, that go to floor 14, which is actually 13, but never have a problem. <laughs> I still look back on that, and I think, is it really the the number or how we view it? Mark, I enjoyed it so much. You know I would, and I look forward to having you back on again sometime. There's a perfect setup for open lines, but more than that, um, sometime we must arrange, a, you know, a cold beverage under a shady tree sometime. Sound good? That sounds fantastic. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Coast to Coast AM. Very good. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.